Hey everyone, this lesson is on infectious mononucleosis. So we're going to talk about what this condition is. We're also going to talk about some of the pathophysiology behind this condition. We're also going to talk about some of the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed and how it's treated. So infectious mononucleosis, or what is often referred to as simply mononucleosis, is a condition of increased levels of monocytes, which are an immune cell. So they're a type of white blood cell. And the condition of having increased levels of monocytes is most commonly due to an infection with Epstein-Barr virus, or EBV. So Epstein-Barr virus is a herpes virus, which is also known as human herpes virus 4, or HHV4. Now, this is the most common cause of mononucleosis, but there are other causes as well, including CMV, or cytomegalovirus, adenovirus, toxoplasma, rubella, hepatitis A, and HIV. So as you can see, a lot of different viruses and one protozoal infection can lead to mononucleosis. But again, the most common cause is Epstein-Barr virus. So we're going to focus specifically on Epstein-Barr virus in this lesson. So what is the epidemiology of mononucleosis? So approximately 95% of adults are seropositive to EBV, which means that they've been exposed to Epstein-Barr virus at least at some point in their lives. So they have antibodies to EBV. So again, the vast majority of adults have been exposed to this virus. Although adults have been exposed at some point in their lives, it seems that the highest incidence of active disease occurs in late teens and early 20s. So again, it is a condition of increased levels of monocytes, most commonly due to an infection with Epstein-Barr virus. There are other causes, but we're going to focus on Epstein-Barr virus in this lesson. And vast majority of adults have been exposed to EBV at some point in their lives, and the highest incidence of active disease occurs in late teens and early 20s. So let's talk more about the transmission and pathophysiology of mononucleosis. So the transmission of Epstein-Barr virus is by the following. Epstein-Barr virus is shed from the oropharyngeal epithelium, primarily. Now, it can be spread by other mechanisms, but this is the primary mechanism by which an individual who has EBV can spread the virus. So they shed it from their oropharyngeal, so their mouth, their throat. So the epithelial cells in their mouth and throat can shed this virus, and this is how they can pass this virus to other individuals. And it's spread by close touch and contact. Again, this is the reason why we often call mononucleosis the kissing disease. Viral shedding can last for a long time. It may occur for upwards of six months. Even when an individual is asymptomatic, so an individual may have no symptoms, they may have had infectious mononucleosis, had the condition resolved, they're asymptomatic, but they're still shedding the virus, and this can often be a way that this virus can spread through the population. So that is how this virus is transmitted, but what about the pathophysiology behind the infection? So there is a latency phase, and this occurs when the Epstein-Barr virus binds to CD21 receptors on B cells, so those are some of your lymphocytes, in your oropharyngeal epithelium. So the primary infection, so that was the latency phase. Now the primary infection is what we call acute infectious mononucleosis. And this is where an individual becomes symptomatic. So there is a time frame between the latency phase and the primary infection. So again, it's transmitted by close contact Viral shedding can last for a long time, upwards of six months, even from asymptomatic individuals. There is a latency phase where the virus binds to B cells in the patient's oropharyngeal epithelium, and then they have a primary infection where they actually become symptomatic. Now, when an individual has a primary infection, there is an incubation period of roughly three to six weeks. And now this is the time frame between when an individual is infected with Epstein-Barr virus, where the virus binds to B cells in their oropharyngeal epithelium, and then the onset of symptoms. So there's a roughly month to month and a half period where they have the virus, but they're not showing any symptoms. So that's the incubation period. So then there's initial symptoms of the infection. These include malaise. So they just feel generally unwell. They have a headache and a low-grade fever. 
So those are the initial symptoms. Now, there is a classic triad of symptoms of mononucleosis, which is important to recognize as well. This includes fever. So fever, very important. Sore throat, so pharyngitis, plus or minus tonsillitis. But for the purpose of this classic triad, it is pharyngitis, so inflammation of the pharynx, so a sore throat, and lymphadenopathy, so swollen, tender lymph nodes. So again, classic triad, fever, sore throat, pharyngitis, and lymphadenopathy, swollen, tender lymph nodes. And the swollen, tender lymph nodes, or the lymphadenopathy, occurs in the cervical chain, so the lymph nodes on the neck particularly, and more specifically, more often occurs in the posterior cervical chain, so on the back side of the neck. So if you have swollen tender lymph nodes on the back side of the neck with these other symptoms, it may be mononucleosis. So again, incubation period of three to six weeks, initial symptoms, malaise, headache, low-grade fever, and the classic triad is fever, sore throat, and swollen tender lymph nodes, particularly in the posterior cervical chain. So the lymph nodes near the back of the neck. Now there are some other signs and symptoms of mononucleosis as well including fatigue. So very, very important symptom of infectious mononucleosis is fatigue. Splenomegaly, which is an enlarged spleen. And splenomegaly is actually very significant. It actually occurs in roughly half of patients who are infected with Epstein-Barr virus. And you can see in this CAT scan, this very, very enlarged spleen on the patient's left side. Patients can also have hepatomegaly, which is an enlarged liver. They can also have decreased appetite. So an individual's stomach is located roughly in this area here. If they have a very enlarged spleen, the spleen itself can push on the stomach. It actually can cause the stomach to be in some ways compressed. So this actually leads to a decreased appetite or early satiety. So patients who actually have an enlarged spleen can often complain of early satiety, which means that they can eat, but they can't eat as much as they used to because their spleen is essentially compressing their stomach. Patients with mononucleosis can also complain of myalgias and arthralgias, myalgias being sore, achy muscles and arthralgias being achy joints. There can also be a skin rash that can occur in mononucleosis as well. It's maculopapular in appearance. And there's some other signs and symptoms as well, including cough, nausea, photophobia, which is sensitivity to light, and diarrhea. Diarrhea particularly occurs in children who are infected with Epstein-Barr virus. And when an individual does have all these symptoms, when they have become ill with infectious mononucleosis, symptoms often improve within two weeks. So there's a two-week period where they have these symptoms Again, a lot of times they have that classic triad we talked about before, fever, sore throat, lymphadenopathy, particularly of the posterior cervical chain. They can also have fatigue and splenomegaly with secondary decreased appetite. So they have all these symptoms, and then they have also these other symptoms as well. But those are the big major ones here. And again, it takes roughly two weeks for symptoms to improve. Now, there's some other information I want to discuss here with regards to infectious mononucleosis caused by Epstein-Barr virus infections. So there's a post-infection period where majority of individuals are asymptomatic. And we talked about this before where individuals can be asymptomatic, but also be shedding the virus. And this can last for upwards of six months. And there's this theoretical possibility of reactivation of the Epstein-Barr virus in the future, although this is very rare. Now, there are some other complications with regards to having an Epstein-Barr virus infection. These include splenic rupture. So because a lot of patients who are infected with Epstein-Barr virus have splenomegaly and large spleen, there is a possibility of splenic rupture where the spleen ruptures and can cause issues. There's also this possibility of aplastic anemia. And there's also this increased future risk of having Hodgkin's lymphoma. So if an individual has had an infection with Epstein-Barr virus in the past, they're at a higher risk of getting Hodgkin's lymphoma later on in their life. And it has been found that Hodgkin's lymphoma is associated with an Epstein-Barr virus infection in upwards of 50% of cases. 
how is infectious mononucleosis diagnosed and treated? So the diagnosis of infectious mononucleosis often involves serology testing. So we take blood sample when we look to see if there has been antibody formation against Epstein-Barr virus. This is what we call the heterophile antibody or monospot test. So easy to remember, monospot, mononucleosis. So that is how it's diagnosed. And once the diagnosis has been made, how do clinicians treat this condition? Well, because this is a self-limited infection, it's self-limited in that it resolves on its own within two to four weeks. Oftentimes treatment is supportive. So when we want to ensure good rest, but also very good hydration. So make sure the patient continues to drink lots of fluids. And in cases where an individual is not hydrating properly, IV hydration may be required. So again, diagnosis of infectious mononucleosis occurs by serology testing, the heterophile antibody or monospot test. So to see if an individual has antibodies against Epstein-Barr virus. And then treatment is supportive because this is a self-limited viral infection. We're not going to use antibiotics because they're not going to work. And this condition resolves on its own, often within two to four weeks. So if you want to learn more about other infectious diseases, please check out my infectious disease playlist. And if you haven't already, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel, stay up to date on future lessons. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.